there's a, a very clean, elegant, or at least simple technical solution. And if you were in the lab, you were going to paper, you could just do that. It may not even be more than a sentence in a paper. Um, but when you're in the commercial world, it, there'll just be some stupid social restriction where you can't do it at all. So you can't, uh, maybe the build system's broken, you can't touch it. Um, they feed you strings that are supposed to be C code that aren't, they won't change it. Um, they won't understand your tool. So a lot of people's version of static analysis is, well, well what's the performance over at that? How many test cases do I need to give you? Um, so you're, you're dealing with a very different level of understanding, um, which has a gross deformation of what you can actually do. Um, okay, so I'll just give one slide of talk of, of context. So we had a pretty straightforward bug finding tool. Uh, the main religion is um, as many bugs as possible, as little work as possible, as little false positive as possible. So our approach was you try to shove as much code through as you can, because 10 times more code is 10 times more bugs. Um, so this was, it was interprocedural, context sensitive. There's a, there's a, uh, at the research level, there was a bit of pass sensitivity, now there's a lot more. Um, and it was, one of the tenets of the religion was aggressive unsoundness. Um, so we discard, couldn't understand a function, you discard it, can't understand a file, you discard it directly, you skip it. Um, you just want, you just want results. Um, and that's worked reasonably well. Um, like a lot of people, um, that did static checking, one of the laws seems to be that if you take some source code that's never checked before and you run through your tool, you'll always find lots of bugs. And if you don't, then you have this knee-jerk reaction, there must be a misconfiguration problem somewhere. I mean, I must not have compiled the code or it must be going to death. Not all of the output, I mean, this, this, this can't possibly be true. Um, and so there's various, various things that were, were, were good about that. All right, so just, I'll do, I'll do a couple caveats and then we'll get into it. Um, so this is very much a voyeur talk. So my former students, primarily um, Seth, Andy, and Ben, went to the company and I'm just sort of looking on as a uh, fond parent that not, that's not very mature. And the company is relatively successful for a static tool company, but that's not saying much. So it's <laughs> sort of tall for a midget category. <laughs> um, but I try to focus on things that are going to be more important in a larger setting. Um, so if they happen with 1,000 customers, they're definitely happening with 10,000. Um, and this is very much just a way of doing things. It's hard to talk in generality, so I try to be very specific, but this doesn't mean it's the way. Um, this hasn't failed yet, is about the strongest thing you can say, I think. Um, all right, so um, in terms of not failing yet, it's been successful enough that we now have a marketing department, so you can tell <laughs> where the transition is. <laughs> um, if you're doing a tool company, it's kind of interesting. You can actually, when we started, um, and maybe other people here's not experiences different. Um, doing tool sales as a straight technology sale was viewed as really hard um, at every level. So you would talk to VCs and you'd say, oh, we're doing a static tool. And they're like, oh, tools. Yeah, tools are hard. Um, and you know, the offers you would get would be like $2 million for half your company. So it's just not, 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 not very interesting. Um, but actually, you can actually make a fair amount of progress. So this is... Uh, a short timeline, um, so we did some research, early 2000, started around 2002. Uh, ben and Andrew were sleeping on the floor, they had one customer. Uh, and then they, they exponentially grew to seven, uh, <laughs> up to about 350. I, I'm not allowed to, to quit another graph after this. Um, but there's a, there's a couple things you can see. Um, one is that the the way that we do it, and there's many other ways to do it, and I'm sure there's many better ways to do it, but at least the way we do it, there's a fairly tight correlation between customers and employees, unfortunately. Because the, the way we do it is we'll send a sales guy and someone, and someone called a sales engineer out to every company, they run the tool. Because people want to see before they spend a lot of money, does it work at all on my code or not? So you have to stick people on airplanes and send them somewhere. And that's, that's unfortunate. It's much better to ship like a web page because then you can get nice, very nice multiples. Here, you can see the multiple is not, not too good, and it's still pretty stable, you know, four or five X. There's, the heuristic seems to be every sales guy can do maybe like 40 opportunities a year, for what that's worth, at least the way we, we do it. Um, one, one thing that seems to happen is, uh, at least for me, you'll tell me a business case for, for doing things a certain way, and then you'll X, and you'll tell me a business case for doing not X, and both would make perfect sense to me. Um, so this is, a, this is an example, this 350 number. So when we started out, everybody who had money that would talk to us, you try to go and you try to sell to them. And so you, know, you do that and you're always very busy and this seems really good because you know, even if they don't have much money now, you can upsell and all this other kind of stuff. But it turns out 
that you'll have these really heavy revenue skews. So I think at this point it was around 50% of the customers were accounted for 6% 6, 6 of your revenue, which um, if you're tied to employees per customer is, is not very good. So they've since gone to more focused on uh, something called named accounts, where you sell a lot to one person rather than to many people. Um, one, one thing that's more generally useful is somewhere around 2005, I don't know, maybe other people have seen a different inflection point, um, the social scene got a lot easier. So you could now call people up on the phone. So before this, you would call them on the phone and you'd say, oh, we have a static tool. And they're like, huh? Or, you know, Lint? No, Lint sucks. <laughs> It's like, no, no, it's not meant. Oh, that's good. <laughs> um, and it was really hard to make any traction. And somewhere around 2005, they started getting it. Like they would sort of, at least a, a reasonable number would vaguely understand what static analysis was. Or they would, there'd be these nice networking effects where they'd worked at a company that had it, or they had a competitor that used it, or there was a whole sector that had it. And you done, no longer had to have as many of these arguments. And that was kind of a nice thing. If you talk to, say, John Pincus from Intrinza, this was definitely not the case at all um, in the 90s. This is a nice, a nice change. Actually, one implication is that now it's no longer shameful to put uh, your logo on a, on a slide having to do with bug finding. At least for, for Prefix and Intrinza, um, because we're saying uh, everybody, they would use it and then they wouldn't want your, their name to get out at all because it's like admitting you're an alcoholic. I mean, I needed help, <laughs> so this is, can't do that. But now if you give them on a, like a 2% discount on sales, they'll let you put, put their logo up everywhere, which is <laughs> good for them. Um, and yeah, please interrupt me at any point. I'm used to getting up at 11 a.m. on uh, West Coast time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in heavy REM right now. So if you, if you prod, things get a lot uh, more interesting. Um, so there's a, I have a bunch of uh, random stories. They mostly come from two verbs. Um, one of the, the, the first verbs is the trial process. So this is how we do every sale. Um, you'll send somebody out, as we said, then you run it on the code. And the, the tricky thing about this is it's a pretty harsh test. So what you usually go into, I mean, you can say this is, this is direct from the slide deck from the sales guys. You can see it's a straight technology type of thing. Um, you can imagine other ways of doing this. Um, one way would be the Rolodex approach where you just talk, talk to the CEO and try to sell down. Um, since we weren't BC funded, that was sort of off the table. So it's, it was pretty much a bottom up type of thing. Um, one nice thing about uh, doing it bottom up is like many areas, you want the person who gets the reward to be the person who's actually supposed to do stuff, or the person who gets punished to be the actual person who's actually supposed to do stuff. So if you sell it to a given technical group and they paid the money for it, they're much more likely to use the tool than if some random guy bought it and said, oh, you have to use it, but there's not really a strong um, authority between the two of them. So this is a, the, the, what happens to the tool is you have to be able to go into large SOS code bases, so 10 million lines of code or, or higher, and, you know, a million lines of code actually used to think was big and now it's actually open. Not, not, not much of a problem. Um, and you, you, have to, you have to run it in a few hours, be able to talk in the afternoon for all the bugs, where random people will just randomly say, oh, what about that bug, or what about this bug? So you have to be able to diagnose bugs really quickly. There has to be a very low false positive rate, because you can't cherry pick stuff. It has to be pretty easy to understand. Um, a bunch of things that make the technical pretty difficult. Uh, the one, there's a couple of differences. I, I'll talk about it in terms of a couple times, because that seems to be what most people are familiar with in terms of static, commercial static tools. Um, one thing that's the same is that we we did what I still, I, I, I argued against as being really stupid, was we charge per line of code for the bug, I mean for the, uh, the static thing. So if you think about it, your model of compiler is compiler is free, or you know I swipe my credit card and I'm done, and it doesn't really matter. Um, so to me this seems really foolish, but actually seems to be like that's a reasonable thing to do. So that was also what, what Intrinsa did. One thing that we did differently is that every trial was free. So the, what John would, would talk about would be, uh, at Intrinsa, would, you, would, you would sign a little waiver. You'd pay $5,000, and you'd sign a waiver. And if you were not satisfied with the results, you'd get your check back, and everybody was happy. And no one ever asked for the check back. The trouble is, it actually tends to add a lot to every sale. And there's not many, actually, there's a surprising few people that have signature authority for any amount of money at all. Everybody can sign for $0, and most people can get a meeting room. So if that's your, your the, the criteria, this is actually pretty easy to get in. Okay. All right. So that's. What's the issue about you having access to the code? Is there like NDA? Like building? Uh, yeah. Often there's NDAs. They won't. With with. They won't let you take the code anywhere. But they they don't usually mind if if you go to where the code is. So what really? So that's. 
things obviously play a lot differently if it's like the NSA. And then it just goes to a whole other level. So we, we have NSA support calls where it's like the guy will call up and say, oh, we have a false positive. It's like, okay, what are you doing? <laughs> well, there's a, there's a structure and there's an integer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Do we have some control flow? <laughs> you know, to flush this out a little bit. <laughs> Dawson, I got a question for you. Yeah. <coughs> what is a bug? When you say that we have to find bugs, you know, what, what, who determines what a bug is? Yeah, the, the person with money. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you, you it's, it's very frustrating. There's no technical definition of a bug, right? Uh, if, I guess the bug, they will fix it or they won't complain about it. <laughs> Some, but yeah, it's very ex either existential or slash uh, operational. Um, and yeah, and one person's bugs and another person's false positives. So, and the research, one random example is, in the research we used to do a lot of statistical inference to find more bugs. You know, you look for, you know, if A followed, it's followed by B 900 times and not once, then good chance A and B have to be correlated, you know, paired, and then that one time was a bug. We don't do, we do very little of that now, unfortunately, it's very frustrating, but what we will do is use statistical analysis to demote bug classes. Like, if you don't seem to care about an error because you just do it everywhere, you might warn you about it a couple times and then just suppress everything else. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> Actually, the, the worst, the wor actually the worst, I think the thing that makes me sickest after all these years is if someone doesn't understand a bug, it's not a bug. You know, anytime they say, huh, it's a false positive. And so that means that what, what happens is you see the analysis scale in t two different ways. So everything that's silent, like everything that say suppresses false positives, I mean, you go crazy. I mean, you just do whatever weirdo, sad, path, sensitive thing you can come up with. Anything that spits out bugs, Whenever you do that, you have to explain why you believe it's a bug. I mean, I can't just say there's a bug that long. You have to say, well, this, I mean, as everybody knows, I'm sorry, um, you know, this happened and this happened and this happened. And so there's a couple problems with that. One is every time you call some complicated subroutine, somehow you have to describe what you did to the person. And they're going to get tired or they're going to get confused and they're not going to, they're not going to understand it. At a more general level, if you can't even describe what the bug is like in a way that someone who doesn't understand compilation gets it, you just can't do whole classes. So we, uh, do very little with heap, with globals. Um, race conditions, for a while, we were very slow on doing anything with it all because you just couldn't explain it in a way that people wouldn't mark everything as false positives. And there'll be a large group of people that do get it, but then there's a the 10% that go nuts that don't get it, and that's actually a, a big problem. Um, just to <laughs> keep saying Intrinsa, um, the same, Pincus, uh, John Pincus also talked about the same thing happening to them where they just dropped false positive, uh, dropped uh, race conditions entirely because they didn't, they didn't see how to, how to describe it. Yeah, so for me, it's very frustrating that in some ways the checkers we have, there's a lot more of them, and they run a lot more robustly, but in some ways they're weaker than what we did at research level. Whereas the false positive suppression is way beyond anything we did. But if you not said both, it go forward, you know, like 10x. Um, does that feel very thoughtful? That's, that's a good expression. <laughs> I wish I could do that one. Um, all right, so that's sort of the context. Uh, and I'll, I guess we'll switch gears. Are there any more questions, actually? I think it's probably helpful. Yeah. So what's the, what's the bug that sells you know, your product, basically? I mean, you must see it over and over again. It's something that shows up. It's something they say, yeah, we needed to find that. Um, yeah, so usually, so use after free seems to be a, a good favorite. Okay. Uh, some buffer overflow crash. One of the best checkers ever is like 30 slides forward, so I probably, yeah, I'll help. <laughs> Unless you want to get seasick. <laughs> uh, it's, well, it's, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it. But yeah, no, it's a, and it, it does seem to depend on the, on the place. Um, I don't know if other people have the same experience, but at least when we look at many different companies, it seems to very much depend on, on, the, on the place. Um, any other questions? Okay, so the, the, our, our initial view of things, was, <coughs> when, when we were publishing this paper, when we did our research, the way we did it was we'd run over Linux and BSD, we'd you know, come up with some idea, run it, count the bugs, stick it in, the, in some tables, pull out some little funny bug snippets, write up intro and conclusion, and ship it. And it seemed to work reasonably well. Uh, we, we thought that since we were running on these real systems all the time, that you know, our tool was really, we wouldn't have much problem selling it. I mean, how much, you know, Linux is pretty bad, so, you know, how, 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 could, this, how could a commercial system be worse? Um, and this was pretty naive, which, but not actually for the obvious reasons. So the, 
at least for me, the fundamental law of tools, it, bug finding tools, is if you don't check, you can't find any bug. You know, if you don't check a system, you don't check a path, you don't check a property, you don't find any bugs there. And if you do check, then you'll find, no matter what you use, you will always find something. And you know, you'll find more or less depending on what you use, but at least, you're, at least you can play the game. And that's, that's a very academic view, because it turns out that there's even more basic laws than this one. Um, so the first one that seems vacuous, but is probably the biggest first order limit on what we find, is you just can't check code you can't see. Um, so this is, it doesn't seem very interesting until you actually try to check code consistently on many different systems. So the, the first thing we did when, when for finding code was we, we grabbed it during uh, the build process. That's, you know, you don't want to do find, recursive find through a directory because you get all sorts of random crap. If you grab it during build, you see exactly what they're trying to, trying to build. So the, the first approach we had was you do make dash w. This would tell you what, what directory you're in. We save this all to a file, then we just do a search and replace and out for GCC or CC or whatever, whatever different compiler you're using. And this is pretty, pretty reasonable. You know, it's like 2x slower than compilation, but not a big deal. Uh, so this, this worked fine. I think it was for four customers. And then the fifth, fifth potential customer, uh, they said, well, how do we bring your tool? I said, oh, you just type make and you grab the output. And they're like, make? You know, we, use, we use clear case. I'm like, oh, clear case. What's that? Uh, so that was, a, that was one of those chasms you can't cross. So we just went a different way. Um, and then I think we went like maybe four or five more customers. And then our best guy ever, I think for the first couple of years, uh, called us on the, on the phone and said, you know, whenever, why is it whenever I run your tool, I have to reinstall my entire box from scratch since <laughs> Linux CD ROM? I was like, that's a, that's a pretty good question. <laughs> so we, we looked, and it turned out that he was using a, a non-standard version of Make, which would spit out the, the direct, current working directory in a slightly weird format that we weren't used to. So we would, using, since we're using Perl, we would grab that, and everything Perl doesn't understand it makes it to the empty string. Then they would CD to the empty string, which would take them to the top level. And then as part of the compilation, they did R minus RF. So there's a race between the buffer cache and, and the system for when it crashed. I think Chess might help on that. So so yeah, my students uh, got irritated with my Perl script at that point. Um, it turns out the, the right right thing is pretty simple. All you do is you just grab things at the system call level. So you can intercept on Linux you know, using something like S-Trace or on uh, Windows using the debugger. You can grab all the system calls so you see exactly which directory they're in, what environment they have, what exactly the command line flags are, because they'll actually change languages with the same compiler from file to file. There is no one, you know, one language that they're using. And you can see all that stuff. And in retrospect, so what, what this lets you do is you can walk in cold to any random company, kick off the build, and just grab just about everything. Consistently, um, it's it's not a trick at all. Um, but I think in retrospect, I, I'm wondering if this was actually more important than the quality of our analysis, because if you can go and grab all code, all, all the code with doing no work, you'll find you know way more bugs than if you go and you have to hack on things a while to get just a small amount of code. Unfortunately, this isn't even this isn't bulletproof. So one thing you'll notice is you actually have to have a command line prompt so you can you can type this. So I think shortly after coming up with this, this hack, I had one company and, and you know, the guy said, have you run it? And he said, oh, we just type a command line prompt. He's like, oh, command line prompt? I, I just press this GUI button. You know, it says build. <laughs> How is this going to work? Um, the, the most recent one was there was a, a large system where we were missing half the code. And it went back and forth for, for I think, about a day and a half. You can figure out where all this code was going. It was right there. You saw it build, and it just didn't, just didn't show up anywhere. And it turned. Scott, Scott McPeak looked at it and finally said, wait, you're on Linux and you're running Visual Studio. How, how could that work? It's like, oh, well, we actually kick off the VMware on the side and then you, know, you run the compilation in there. So we just, all the stuff escaped off on the side. So there's a, a bunch of random things you'll be wanting to do that uh, you wouldn't do if you were a normal academic. Uh, so just as, as one final example, uh, where because you want to make a sale, the, the trite becomes fundamental. Um, on Windows, so we do this on Windows by just grabbing it at the, at the debug level. And Windows, one of the most widely used, I guess not anymore, but very, very widely used um, compilers, this one version of Visual Studio, has a use after free bug. So if you run it normally, it runs fine. It runs, it frees some memory, it then reads the memory, no one's done in malloc, so the contents are still there, so the compilation goes through, exits, everything's fine. 
If you run it in the debugger, it switched to the debugging version of mount, which as soon as you free it, mem sets everything to a special bit pattern, which is not all what you wanted to read when you came through the second time. From the user's point of view, all that, the, the main change is when they run with our tool, everything crashes, and when they don't run with our tool, everything works. <laughs> um, any, any guesses what the solution is? You just, yeah, set, set in debug to zero, uh, and then and there you go. So, uh, actually, yeah, okay. So the second, second thing, which, second law, which seems vacuous to state, is if you can't, you can't check code, you can't force, uh, which seems useless to try to talk about. It's like saying I can't compute if I run out of zeros. Um, but this is important because there's this widely held myth that the C language exists. But you know, C doesn't exist, C++ doesn't exist, Java doesn't exist. None of these languages exist at all. What exists is that there's a stack, you know, there's an idea of a language and there's a stack of paper, uh, maybe called the standard, but these, are, these aren't comp compilers. So what, what people really program in is, the, is this, the string is accepted by their compiler. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll cheat it and if it, doesn't, if it doesn't reject it, that's C. And this is a, it's a very operational definition. And the trouble is if, if your if you're front end uses the C language in a more rigorous sense, uh, it's going to reject a lot of this stuff, and that's not going to be very helpful in terms of making sales. So I'll just I'll I'll, I'll just pick up things a bit quickly. Um, since we're and there's there's a lot of code like this, unfortunately. And since since we're an unsound tool, this doesn't really matter, right? In some sense, I mean, you can skip a function, skip a file, move the directory, you just don't care. The thing that unfortunately happens quite a lot is that you'll have some core header file included by everybody. There'll be some illegal construct here, and then you'll run it over the entire system, and every time your system, your tool will spit out, you know, there's a, there's a parse error, parse error, parse error, parse error. You'll find no bugs, and they don't need your tool to do that. And they'll probably find this pretty amusing and tell their friends about it. And they'll certainly not think your tool is very deep if it can't even need C code. So just some specific examples. Uh, so this is one of the first ones we saw. I think this was customer eight. This was a large networking company that you're probably running the code for. So in one of their key header files, there's some function redacted to foo, and they declare int a, and then they like a so much to do int a again. <laughs> and this is, it's obvious what the intent is. It's also obvious it's not C code. And if you feed it to any C compiler that wasn't their C compiler, it would reject it. Uh, so this is, uh, this is from Embedded, which is a wild source of crazy extensions. So here we have void x. Uh, storage size of x is not known. Uh, it seems to be what here, they're, they're trying to make a label without having any storage space. Uh, second, or third one, the little mnemonic. So in the middle of a hatch, you can put it on your score, which is useful, but also not C. Um, uh, here we get a little bit more mnemonic. <laughs> uh, useless indeed. Um, and, and they wanted to find bugs in the code. They did not want to find this bug. So it's very much like the chess experience talked about before. Um, so it's not helpful if you reject all the code. Um, the other things like, you know, at text if you're embedded. Uh, and then ASM, people just go nuts. Uh, since ASM is un unportable or non-portable, they just do all sorts, every compiler has its own little screwed up way of doing things, which isn't helpful if you just want to rip it out. So these are all sort of different ways. So this is my favorite. You can just put the machine code right into a buffer and jump through. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, different compilers, you can flip languages on the line by line basis, uh, which is nice. So uh, actually, Dawson, would, I, would you say that a high level learning here is that it's probably better to target static analysis to the binary level rather than at the source level. I, the trouble is you lose so much semantic information. I, I, I mean, I, I personally, I, I view CPT already as evil because you know it's gonna it's gonna take max buff length and turn it into 255 and just boil away a lot. You know, I, there's a lot of checkers where I want to know if there was a macro here or not um, and things like this. On the other hand, you know, things like Java people seem to do fairly well, and our our Java tool works at the bytecode level as well. So I, it would be nice to fail over. You know, if I can't do anything, hell, at least I'll do binary. Um, but it's so much nicer at the, at the, at the source level. But th there are other people doing, doing things at the binary level, at least, at least for C code. Um, but I think, uh, if, and if anyone has other experiences, you should just speak up. So I, How about generated C? Are there like a lot of scripts and stuff that like generate stuff on the fly? People don't seem to do that anymore. No. I mean, you get you get the lux and yak files, but not <clears throat> at least I don't. We haven't run into that too much. It's a shame. Yeah, people don't seem to write tools to generate stuff that much. So do they use tools like Vaugrind, like uh, dynamic tools? 
I'm sorry? Tools like Valgrind, yes. do they use this, uh, this report? Use dynamic tools like Valgrind to find bugs? Do we use Valgrind? Do they use Valgrind? Uh, some number. I don't, I don't know how many people use, use Valgrind. I mean, there's still a lot of purified holdouts. There's, uh, and it's rules Valgrind's 10x. So you're, it's kind of hard to run on a lot of stuff. And I guess, I say I don't know. Um, like in embedded space, you tend not to see as much, certainly. Um, anything like OS related, not, not so much. Um, <coughs> all right. So the, the way we handle this is to just rip it all out. Sort of the obvious late night hack you would come up with. But this is actually the cornerstone of the whole approach. Uh, anytime you hit something you don't like, uh, you just replace it with a little pattern and an if zero and if it out. This is one of those cases where being unsound you get more bugs. Because uh, if you couldn't eat the file at all, you wouldn't check it. So now you just rip stuff out. And as long as you didn't do a too bad a job, you're okay. So just since we're all good scientists, uh, one question is quantification. So just how much does C not exist? Uh, so our starting point is we took the EDG, which they've been building for about 20 years to parse C code. So if anyone's going to do the job right, it would be these guys. Uh, and even for these guys, after 20 years, when they came for bug and feature and even bug compatibility, like for each, if a given compiler will screw up a construct in a certain way, there'll be a big, huge comment in the EDG source code, and they, they will screw up their parse tree in the same way, and they're very dedicated. Uh, even with those, for very common compilers, you still see there's, there's hundreds of lines, or in some cases thousands of lines, where we have to rip out code to make not C look like C code. And this is, it's just completely unbelievable. I, I'm still in shock. Um, we actually have a full-time team. I think now it's five people that just work on this full-time. This is their job. And they're really good people. This is just an amazing waste of uh, intellectual talent. And they're still not finished. So every time, you know, if you're on the mailing list for these trials, every time you'll just see some random new construct that someone has come up with. Because uh, there's all these monkeys spitting out strings, and then once the string gets accepted by the compiler, it just gets encased in the source code. And that's your problem. But how do you uh, uh, <coughs> fix the problem? You have to manually go and edit that file, but oh, no, allow, no. They, no. they will not allow you to edit No, you can't touch anything. You can't touch it. Yeah, yeah. You can't touch it. It doesn't matter how, how much bullshit it is. Like how, I see. how you can say so you add something more to your code to take you, just, you stick it in the parser. So just, okay. rip, well, we have those little patterns that would rip it out. So if, if I know it's this compiler and I see Pragmar as I'll just, I'll get this zeroed out. So, so your, your regression suites must be also in yeah. to keep up because you've got to like keep all these things. Yeah. You've got to make sure you don't break the other guys when you're... Well, these, these, it'll these be... These are pretty easy, I guess. Well, yeah, these are, these are modular. Yeah. But what will happen that sucks is sometimes we'll run into things where we can't fix it, and so we'll get EDG to do it. Oh. And then uh, it's, what do you do? If you upgrade to them, they've yeah. actually bundled a bunch of things, and now a bunch of stuff yeah. that works doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And all the EDG sources, they take slightly different dialects. And it's, um, yeah, it's boring, superficial, and really important. <laughs> I don't like <laughs> that. That, that's, that part I don't like so much. Yeah. Um, so, do you have any competitors? I do mean, we what? Do you have any competitors? How many yeah, yeah. companies have put in enough effort? Uh, well, most people would get EVG, and uh, people go after different stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, I think main competitors would be like Fortify and Clockwork. Uh, so also have They've different. done, but they haven't. Have they done all of this too, and they can walk in with these random compilers? And uh, well, I mean, people make money doing different stuff. I don't know if they've gotten as wide. So, uh, so let me turn it around there. I think the thing is, Coverity does a lot of focus on the embedded space, and embedded spaces where people do a lot more of this really funky C code. It's well, I do Fortify does not do as much. You know, do work as much with people who do really funky C code. But even if you just did Microsoft, you would be very busy. Um, once, once someone views conformance as a competitive disadvantage, I mean, you're going to have your hands full. So, uh, well, it's partially embedded. Unfortunately, it's not. It seems, so for example, <laughs> to skip ahead, uh, so what Coverity, not so much embedded, but large bases. So anytime you have a large source code base, you almost always have an old compiler. That old compiler has very little to do with a modern standard. And there's not one old compiler. There's many smeared across several decades. So in one place in particular you get really reamed is if it's a, attached to some government agency. So if you're doing anything with, to do with FDA or SEC, anytime you change your tool chain, you have to recertify everything. Whether it's, it's not rational, but you have to do it. Um, and so you don't do it ever. Uh, so you'll see these compilers that are literally 20 years old. And so you have these problems like how do you buy a compiler that's you know, 20 versions ago? 
So we've actually had our guys snipe it on eBay for different copies of these things so that we get it in-house. In because I can't replicate, I can't support your compiler unless I can run character strings through it myself. So I, I actually need a working copy, so it's actually quite difficult. And then the NSA is their own set of, some own set of issues. And it's been really, actually, still quite hard for us, I don't know, for other people to get source code. Um, if it's a small company, they'll tend to do it more than they used to. But even if we sign NDAs, even if it's redacted, run through preprocessor, everything, they won't, they won't give it to us. So this is maybe because we're so small that if you sue this, you wouldn't get any money. Whereas if we were you know, much bigger, maybe you'd you know, please take my source code and <laughs> <laughs> so I can retire. Um, and this is, this is really a problem, especially for performance problems. So you know, our sales guys have to type stuff in for, for, for memory. And so performance problems get solved in exactly two ways. One, they will actually give us the source code, and I think that's happened a small number of times. So it's now in our regression suite. Or they'll actually let us send someone out and work on site for like you know, a week. But uh, unless either of those two happen, you just can't solve any of this stuff. Uh, so you only hit performance problems because of uh, not, not the ability, not because of the inability to see source, source no, code? No, no, no. Like false yeah. positives and all that stuff could um, also be affected by that, right? Yeah, no, we, we hit performance problems for any reason you can think of. Um, and probably not the reason we're thinking of, which means <laughs> which makes it hard to diagnose remotely. Um, I mean, once you're going over, you know, millions of lines of code, and you do it in enough places, there's just going to be some weird stuff that happens. There'll be like the wrong switch statement in a for loop that really just blows the pass out, and then you, you get hosed or something like that. Um, or there'll be a weird thing that happens, with usually that often happens is, you know, some, some little construct will happen frequently that eats up a lot of memory that we never saw before, and our memory blows out, so you have to go find what that is. Yeah? Yeah, it's probably not too small, the suit thing. I mean, we work with uh, teams at Rational and building tenant tools, and they don't have any customer source code either. Okay. They well, that, that might be because they're so big they could be suits. They don't want it. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. The social uh, physics are, are kind of weird. But yeah, it's, it's, you, you don't have what you would, and, and academia, this would just not be a problem. I check some open source, something weird happens, you know, I, go, I change it so like all these problems go off. I adapt to that one compiler, whatever, it's just not, not an issue. Uh, so heuristic is, if you've heard of it, you're going to support it, um, and including a bunch of stuff you've never heard of. And some of it, so you, you see, uh, much of this is about normal distributions. <laughs> So one of, the, one of my favorite is, you see enough compiler companies, you see some strange ones. So one of them is a gaming company that also does photography for uh, fantasy convention and uh, on location photo shoots for, yeah, <laughs> anime. <laughs> so their, their, their lobby is, is what you might expect. Um, okay, so I'll start, I'll, sorry, I need to, I'll, I'll pick up the pace a bit. Um, so bugs, false positives, false negatives. So as, as Tom mentioned, the relationship with people and, false and bugs is a little strange, um, unfortunately. So one thing, you go, on a, you go on a trial, you'll find an awesome use set for free bug, memory corruption, something that if you hit it, it will destroy your system, and probably much later. You know, it just seems like an obvious thing. You'll see, you know, you think this is home run, I will now make a sale. And you show it to the people, and the people are like, well, you know, so, you know, what, what's this, you know, and you're like, what's this going to do? It's, well, it's a crash the system, we'll get a call. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This conversation is going a little bit different than I thought. Um, and it turns out that if, if they don't get, you know, if they don't feel any pain, they're not going to do it. And this is not just customer whinging about customers. This is actually internally in our, in, our, in, our, in our own house. So if you sell a bug finding tool, the obvious thing is you better run it because everybody's going to ask you, well, have you run your own code? And, you know, how often and does this help you? So you, you have to constantly be running it. And if, actually, if you force people to run it on, if you force the people who built the tool to run it, um, before they can check in any code, what do, you, what do you expect them to do? They won't do it, right? No, they have to. Yeah. So you we have to check that box off that we ran it every time there's a... Change the tool. They'll have the pragma saying uh, false. Well, they're not allowed to do pragmas, but yeah, they, they, will, but yeah. They, they will know is that they'll know how to handle source code. Maybe it handles for loops really well and it doesn't do while loops, so everything becomes while loops. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I didn't say that, that certainly is not recorded. <laughs> There's been a little back and forth. <laughs> um, so you would think that bug, if people buy bug finding tools, you think bugs matter. And it turns out that not if there's too many of them or if they're too hard. Um, and you also get into things where people argue that it's not a bug. So uh, you see enough code, you see weird code, you see enough developers, you see some weird developers. So these are things that actually happen more than once. Uh, so you'll have a results meeting, you talk about stuff. So this is one. Uh, this is this nice little dead code thing uh, for 
I equal one, I less than zero, you know, you're never gonna execute that loop. And the guy's like, well, you know, that, that's a loop. Loops execute at least once. That's a loop. Like, no. <laughs> you are so fucking stupid. <laughs> uh, next one is, you'll have things that are, are bugs, and maybe you can argue they're not. So this is a mem set. Uh, this is 32-bit machine, declared three integers. A, B, A is two elements. This is a mem set of zero of 12 bytes. You know, so he knows the stack grows down, so this actually will work fine. Uh, he argues long term, you know, this is, this is more efficient. So I'm gonna do this. <laughs> I shouldn't do that. Uh, next guy frees foo, then uses the right after, but there's no malloc between them, so that's okay. Uh, this one happens all the time. It's like every three months we see this. Uh, so you have uh, array of four indexes into P of four, sets it to I. Uh, well, you know, ANSI C lets you go one past the end of the array, where they, they misread things about addressing. It's like, you know, I can assign right there. It's like, no, that's why you have an array size. And, <laughs> and there's this really subtle interplay between size and zero-based offsetting. Uh, anyway. Uh, all right. So, so, so actually, at this point, I'm going to have to ask this question. So your mantra from the very beginning mm -hmm. was pump lots of code through the tool mm -hmm. and find lots of bugs, mm -hmm. right? But what, what I'm seeing now is that it's not, I mean, you can find lots of bugs that your tool can find, but it seems that that's not what people want. So that's what, what is not the, some people want. So I'm just talking about the funny people. Right. The normal people aren't funny. So for most people, <laughs> like your parents. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's a normal distribution. So the, the, the left side of the tail, depending on how you label the axis, is, is amusing. Um, but it's going to happen, so you should you know, you have to have some approach. Uh, so, so one thing you have to deal with is, is just this, which is how you handle cluelessness. So if someone's really smart, then you can talk to them. You know, if they're wrong or you're wrong, they'll sort it out. And if they're kind of dumb, they'll, you can also argue with them because they know it. If they're really dumb, it's like modular. Where they think that you're the idiot, and you can't actually argue with them. And if you argue at all, you're gonna you're gonna kill the sale. So the solution that we've seen that seems to be one one way to go is you try to have a large meeting. So if you have a large meeting, you also have a normal distribution, and you'll have the guy over here, but you also have the guy over here that can shut him up. Um, so is it, you know you have ten people. There'll be one smart person, or at least they care about bugs, or they get fired if if they if they uh, if there's bugs, or if, or they're in another group. The more people you have, the more likely at least one person from another group. So the tribe as well, you can sell to the other group as well. Or if you have enough people, at least one of them will get fired, which also tends to be good. <laughs> Not for them, but for sales. So there was a, a company, X, which uh, Coverity sold to, and then the next week they fired 110 people. So any guesses for, is this good or bad for Coverity? Bad, bad, bad for people, but. It's good for you. Uh, why? Well, you explained to me. They all went out to other companies. And yeah, yeah, so they, they go and they, yeah, yeah. So they, all those people, well, not all, but a large number got hired, and then four of them bought it in, bought, bought in Coverity for trials, and this actually went to sales. It's, so, actually, oh, I didn't realize people could actually read papers, so. <laughs> After this, I'll skip ahead to the, the new stuff. Um, okay, so people are looking at buying a bug funny tool, you think bugs matter, and it turns out there's funny inflection points. So if it's less than a thousand bugs, they actually seem to matter, and they'll go fix them all. But they make an effort, often, uh, to go do it. If it's more than a thousand, they do something called baselining, um, which means that they, they'll only fix new bugs, uh, which are somehow different than the old bugs. Um, and this is actually not entirely rational, because the only way you can get a thousand bugs is you have to have a big, huge source code base, and the only way you can have a big, huge source code base is it's pretty old. And so it's already been working more or less, so you don't want to go mess it up by fixing stuff that and maybe actually make it worse, but you want to fix the new stuff. So one, another less rational reason is if you're a manager in a non-technical company, um, which is true for most technical companies, uh, you'll, every little metric of bad you have and time, you want, you want bad to go down. This is how you get a bonus. Um, and on the other hand, if the tool improves, you get a graph like this. <laughs> and that's not good for bonuses. <laughs> uh, and so you'll see these large companies invent the same thing over and over again, which is how do you upgrade when upgrading is bad? And so everybody's, well, some people settle on never, so this way you always improve. Or you'll, do, you, you'll renew, but you don't upgrade, which is a more expensive version of that, but at least it seems like there's progress going on. Um, you'll never do it before a release, which is once you use a tool for gating, so it's actually useful, you'll actually not improve it very much because then it means you couldn't do the release, so they'll, they'll sort of stagger things out. Um, everybody upgrades and then rolls back when they discover that all the bug counts went up. I don't like that. Uh, and they certainly will not do it before a meeting when they're going to get judged. 
And they, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, I mean, isn't the real issue here that, that there's no direct correlation between the number of bugs or fixing a certain number of bugs and having improved software? In other words, if it's just numbers, you know, and you're saying, well, now there's more than there was yesterday, but it's, the software is still the same. Um, how, do you, how do you make the case that, you know, not reducing that number actually makes the software better? I guess it's, so it's two things. So I, I certainly agree it would be really nice if you could show the implications. Because I find 10,000 bugs, probably 10 matter. The rest are a waste of time. And if you go and fix them, you'll probably make your code worse. Right. Right, because you'll, you'll, you'll break it. And one, one in a hundred times at least you're going to break something. And you'll probably do it more often. Um, so it would be really nice to actually, if I had a huge chunk of code, I could actually figure out the, the bugs that were really important. Um, I think, hopefully people will get, I don't know how Static can do that. Very well, other than finding serious bugs that you think in general are serious and promoting those. Um, a lot of our research has since gone to dynamic, actually, in part because of that, that, that approach. I mean, if you can show someone like a concrete thing that blows up their code, then they tend to be much more engaged. Um, it would be nice. Um, I, I think uh, other people have had probably slightly different experiences, but it would be nice if there was a stronger, tighter coupling between bug and bad, and you could show it, because then they would be much more likely. I don't know, what, what do you guys find? So, well, I mean, we have this Sage tool that, you know, I mean, when you are able to create a test case, right, and run it independently, blow things up, especially since it's oriented towards security vulnerabilities. That's, like, awesome. And, uh, yeah. Have you guys experimented much with trying to do that? I mean, yeah, we plead, right? But yeah, we've been generating attacks for a while. The, 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 which is good because people pay attention. The trouble is you, you have a couple zeros less. Every dynamic tool, it seems like you take a good static tool and its bug counts compared to all dynamic tools ever done ever, it still beat it. <laughs> the static will still beat the dynamic, yeah. Yeah, right. which is unfortunate. But, but Dawson, this is the point, right? I mean, I mean, just finding lots of bugs is not the point, right? We try and improve software quality. Since when did just finding a shitload of bugs become so important? I mean, you published in this space. I've read some of your intros. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm totally on your side of tapes. We should find the important ones. Right? Right. This is very so, skewed. So, so, okay, now I have to make a so, so, what in my experience, what I've found is that static analysis tools tend to be very customized towards what the tool can do. On the other hand, often developers will pay more attention to a bug when they are in control of what is to be checked, what they want, yeah. uh, you know, the thing to check. And there's a mismatch there because static analysis tools are not usually at so powerful that they can take any property that, you know... Yeah, what, what, we've seen the same thing where, where you can customize the tool. I mean, this grew out of everything is supposed to be customized. So you would tailor it to a given, it would be a hardcore system-specific checking system for your every little chunk of code. So it turns out that if some guy writes his own little wimpy little checker that finds some toy little bug, if he finds any of those bugs, he likes those bugs like a thousand times more than yours. Sure, yes. Yeah. It's, it's more it's, it's systematic. What, what people, uh, well, this is sort of scattered on later, but what, what people will certainly do is if you find bugs that killed them in the past, they tend to pay a lot more attention. Um, if you miss the bugs that killed them in the past, then they get less impressed. And if you miss bugs that are really stupid, then they get really unimpressed. Um, so for us, what happens is, uh, I have some slides on this, but we have, we do uh, like model checking type caching to handle exponential paths. So often we'll cache out at places that there's an interesting bug there and we'll miss it because we just did, didn't even explore the path. Uh, so that's, that's bad if they know about it. Um, another, well, I'll go ahead. Keep, keep poking because it gets more interesting. Um, and, well, the, so people seem to, I, I don't know. So by the way, so the, the next talk is supposed to start now. Oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> so why, why don't you wrap up in five minutes? Is that, is that, is that going to be possible? Wow, yeah. Uh, <laughs> boy, I really screwed up. I should have done the new stuff first. I apologize. Um, or if people are willing to stay for an extra 15 minutes, I not go I'll, I'll try at to, noon. I'll try to wrap up. Why don't I try to do that? Um, is that okay? So, oh, no, no, so it doesn't. Take 10 minutes. I think people are okay with uh, staying an extra 10, 15 minutes. Is that okay? Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Really sorry. Um, so uh, I'll just go quickly. Uh, so false positives uh, matter somewhat. We aim for like 30%. Uh, they're all over the map. The thing you really don't want is anything embarrassing. 
you don't want an embarrassing false positive if you have an expensive tool. So if someone wrote a big check, they're pretty high up, they probably have at least one enemy, and if that enemy gets a little, a little false positive that fits in a punchline, you can't, you can't believe this jackass, he spent like this much money on this tool, they can't even handle this thing. Uh, it's not, not, not very good. Uh, one thing where bugs matter a lot is if you've already looked at a bug, you want it not to go away. So um, in terms of false negatives, what happens is when you upgrade the analysis engine or you upgrade the, the checker, it's going to find slight, often for us, maybe not for other people, but often for us, you'll find slightly different bugs from run to run. Like if you're dealing with exponential paths, so you'll cash out on some other versus others, you'll, your approximation will get tickled in different ways. And when you make these changes, it's not always clear what the, what, what's going to happen, especially when you run on all the different customers. And the trouble is, is when you shift the defects slightly, they, they knew in theory before that you weren't really a verifier, but they tend to have this magical thinking where you find a bunch of bugs and they sort of impugn these more strong powers on your tool than, than it may have, and you don't always dissuade them from this. But then if you, they run a, a new version and they, you lose a couple hundred bugs that they knew were there, they really know it's not a verifier. And this is not a happy day uh, for anyone. So one of, the, one of the huge changes from academia is that huge classes of, of approaches you can't do anymore. Um, so for us, there's this thing called jitter, which is from release to release. You know, you find maybe more bugs, but different bugs, not the same bugs. And this is really bad because people really don't like this. And this was very different from academia, where you just, you know, you ran it, you counted bugs, you published, and that was it. That was, that was great. Um, the, the trouble here is that it makes, it makes whole class, of, so you can't do randomization anymore. You know, very simple, elegant way to handle exponential stuff. Can't do it. You have lots of exponentials, too bad. Can't do time knots either. Uh, every time you change the tool, you have to go through this very complicated thinking for, could this screw anything else up? Is this going to have any weird effect where I drop bugs that I didn't have before? Um, one of our biggest sources for this is caching, as I mentioned. Where if we get to the same program point, the checker's in the same state, we do like a model checking hack where we don't explore both paths, we just explore the first time. And this tends to get very different. This will get different bugs from run to run. Find lots of bugs, but not always the same ones. So true story for version two. When we got to an if statement, we used to follow the true path and the false. Version three flipped it for reasons that weren't that interesting. Um, errors fluctuated by 20%, and people just went insane. Um, anyone guess the solution? Yeah, just flip it back. <laughs> Leave it at that. <laughs> Uh, not, not so good. One of the, okay, this is, this is the thing that still frustrates me, is that um, the, the main tragedy for me is every hung goes to false positives. If they don't understand something, it's now a false positive. And so this, no one reads the manual. They don't want to look stupid. They want to say the tool is stupid. And that's, and once you start getting a couple false positives, you get a lot more. It's avalanche, and they're not independent events. Once they think this tool spits out false positives, then they just mark everything as false positives. They won't spend any time looking at stuff. And this has a huge impact, um, especially when you couple with the fact that there's been this vision. So when you're in academia, you're the author, you're the tool writer, you're the bug inspector, you understand everything. So you, and you are incentivized to make that damn thing work so you get tenure and you get a job or whatever. When you split these, now you have the tool builder and you have the customer. And the customer is very lazy, they're inattentive, they don't want to look stupid, they don't understand much. And so dealing with the bug reports from most of these tools, you have to be fairly sophisticated for many checkers, and you no longer get to do that. So as I said before, we dropped all sorts of statistical inference. We don't do ranking anymore, uh, not entirely for technical reasons. Uh, tend not to do much heat tracking or globals, very slow in concurrency, very slow in adding a lot of other checkers. Uh, so things lag behind. Uh, Doctor. Yeah. So this thing about initial sales versus later, can you at least fix later once they like port into the tool list? Uh, you could, I think. I believe so. <laughs> when I try to push people to do it, they tend not to. They, people tend to be least resistance, at least within our company, at least within Covarity, um, which is unfortunate. Um, I think th there's a whole set of power users that you could really just crank things up and get 10x more. Personally, that's, that's what I believe. I mean, once your know, knowledge is really is power when it comes to something like this. And so far, they're not really doing much there, unfortunately. In companies that adapt it, do they have quality specialists? It means they're only running your tool and they understand that? They, the guys at Career are now trying to do more services stuff. We buy the tool and you also buy services. 
Because um, the tool out of the box, I think any tool that's good out of the, well, let me, let me just take all that back. This tool out of the box will be nowhere near as strong as this tool customize your, your code base. Because um, you, I mean, you can tune the hell out of a lot of different things. Well, if you can understand what it says, like the way Yeah, you actually, one of the frustrating things for false positives is that the last, talking to Scott McPeak, who's one of the main um, technical guys, the last three customer sites he went to where they said there was too many false positives all because they just didn't understand what the checker was doing. And so it's, it's not technical at all. It's like, they, did, they thought the checker was doing X, it was doing Y, and they're like, oh, this is all crap. And so this is, it's nice if problems are just technical. Um, yeah. Actually, it, and there's this, there's this thing with where we add, this is, actually I'm curious what other people have found. When, when we've added more analysis, things have gotten worse in some places. And this is true for every tool I've built. Um, static, dynamic, model checking, if you want to call it that. Um, so this is like uh, many years ago, we, ran a bunch of static tools over a bunch of code, and then we later on did a bunch of implementation level model checking where we ran the code and did a lot of interleavings. And the belief we had was that the monitoring was going to be way more work, you're going to lose a month of your life, but you know, the, it's so much deeper that they, you know, should find a lot, a lot more bugs. And it turned out that when they checked the same property, static always found like 2x more. And you look at you know, why that is, well, it's you know, dynamic, it, had the, it only hit the paths it hit, and static hit all the paths, and it really cared about precision, so if your model had an error in it, Sometimes it was lead to false positives, sometimes it false negatives. False positives you would fix, false negatives are still there. You make more and more changes, you get more and more false negatives, you just never even saw it. The symbolic analysis we had had the same thing. It had the most brutal paper deadline um, I've ever had, which is we ran on Linux and we would find um, Cog Creek disk images that if you mounted them would blow up a Linux box. So that was, that was kind of fun. Um, so we wrote a paper about it, submitted it, got in, and then found that our tool had a whole bunch of bugs in it. So we went and fixed the bugs. And now we could no longer find the bugs in Linux. Because the, the tool got more precise, so it got lost in these exponentials. So we couldn't actually touch them, the, the, the bugs there. And so we were all these late night hackings. And I think we got extensions like two days past the camera ready deadline. We finally found the bug again. We sent it off. Uh, but this, is, this seems to show up everywhere. <laughs> uh, OK, so, oh man. <laughs> OK. Uh, well, rats. Okay, fine. We did that. Uh, just some random numbers. Um, any, I guess, any questions? I, I, so, just really quickly, um, since this tends to be a whiny talk, I'm actually very optimistic on this space, as anyone, probably anyone here who does static tools is, because you know, that if you can't find the code, you can't check it. If you if you if you can't compile the code, you can't check it. But on the other hand. Every system you go to, if you can find the code and there's enough of it, and you can compile enough of it, you'll always find bugs. If you don't, you know, there's some compilation problem, there's a configuration problem, there's lots of bugs there, you'll always find stuff, no matter how stupid your tool is. Um, and this is pretty nice, and you can actually make a lot of progress, as most people here know. Um, so, I follow all bands, sorry. I should have started at the end of the talk instead of the beginning. I apologize. Are there any other questions? More aggressive questions? Yeah. So, so you have to support all these weird compilers, and presumably it's worth it to you to do that? Does yeah. That mean that well, then you should see the list that we don't these support. Companies on sort of the extremes of these distributions um, have a ton of money to, to give you, you, you know what I mean? Um, well, there's a long list of compilers that we don't support, and there's actually a long, growing list of potential customers we don't even go to. Okay. Um, so you actually do cut out a lot. And this is the ones that you have to have to deal. Like you, you know, you sort of have to deal with Microsoft, or if there's a huge system out there, um, whatever their code base, you know, whatever their compiler is, you kind of want to go after it. Um, as Bill said, embedded, they have a pretty wild set of extensions. And if you don't like, you like people that care about bugs, and so since people even care if their toaster crashes, embedded is pretty nice. Still, like it's safe for compilers that will get 99% of the users, so it's not that long tail in there. Um, probably. <laughs> So, and, 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 and let me, sorry, let me, this is a very idiosyncratic view of the universe. If you're in a, within a company, um, as some people are, where there's a, a more monolinguistic culture, a lot of these problems are just not interesting. So, One question, why do people call for it, and what is the main selling point, and what, what drives them? Is it like some catastrophic bug they had, or just the uncomfortableness that they might have problems, so what, what makes people do that? I, I think if they, if they hit a problem, it's nice. I mean, as, as other people know, I mean, if someone's got burned, they're receptive. 
they've lost something important because of this. They're very receptive. You know, uh, you, know you always sell fire insurance after the house burned down. But this is, it tends not to be like that. I mean, it tends to be they're, they're buying because our, our, our sales guy is bugging them. Or, you know, they read something about it. Or, you know, they hired somebody that knew something about it. Uh, I, I think it's a pretty broad set. I think what, what's definitely changed, as I said before, is the culture has changed in the last five years. People are much, much more